Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this very important event. My name is Lillian Krapel, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of the HPV Cancers Alliance. We're a small, young, but very energetic nonprofit organization with an important mission that consists of only four words, spread knowledge, save lives. I'm so pleased that always by my side, I have my dear friend, a very talented actress and a generous, inspiring cancer thriver and activist, Marsha Cross, who co-founded the HPV Cancers Alliance with me. Thank you, Marsha. Lillian, we would not be here without you. We all know that you are the tour de force in this operation. Well, with a little wind in the sails from Dan. Anyway, thank you very much for that introduction. I love you, I adore you, here we go. Um, as Lillian mentioned, our mission is to spread knowledge to save lives. And the reason we chose to focus on this, uh, which is something different than other cancers, is that the six HPV related cancers are both preventable and treatable if diagnosed early. And we have decades old, uh, a decades old vaccine that is shown to be effective for prevention. We have diagnostic tools at the ready. We have the HPV test, the pap smear, uh, the digital rectal exam, my favorite caught my cancer. Um, and we have uh, oral exams that can be given by your uh, dentist um, to look for a flu cancer. So we don't need further drugs or there's no mystery here. What we need is patients and doctors to have the knowledge to diagnose HPV, to catch it early, to know the symptoms. We need uh, patients to be able to advocate for themselves to say, oh, you know what, maybe that isn't a hemorrhoid. Uh, I've waited a few times, uh, weeks, and it's not going away and, and insist on being seen again um, or take that lump on your, on your throat very seriously. Uh, these are all important symptoms. Anyway, I'm rambling. So we are so, here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you go for it, Lil. I'm rambling. Is it, I didn't know. Is it my turn? It's your turn. Okay, okay. Marsha. Thank you so much. And let me tell you right back at you because there's nobody else that I want to go through this journey with than you. I'm sorry we had to go through what we did to meet each other, but I'm so blessed that it's you. Um, so everybody, spreading knowledge requires mouths and ears. And the more we have, the more knowledge we can spread. It takes a village. That's why we decided to partner with some of the leading nonprofit organizations in the country that touch on the issue of HPV. We call those amazing organizations our mission partners, since we're all united sharing the same goal. All of those organizations have been helping us in various ways and supported us in getting the word out about today's event. Therefore, I'd like to recognize each of them for their contribution. Thank you to the Farrah Fawcett Foundation, Vax to Stop Cancer, the Anal Cancer Foundation, Survivor, Ian's, AHEC, ASHA, New York, New York State Cancer Coalition, HPV and Me, Head, Neck and Cancer Alliance, Cancer Care, and Lancashire Hospitals in the United Kingdom. As a quick shout out, I also want to express my special thanks to Brian, Gwen, and Kate, as well as Janine and Steve for their help with this event for supporting our efforts throughout the year. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, everybody. We are so happy to have everybody on board. We are going to make a difference, Lil. Okay, so one of the reasons that we wanna talk about HPV in front of the public is that one of the barriers to knowledge is stigma. And sadly, there is still a stigma about HPV, which really makes no sense to me. But anyway, here we are, and uh, we wanna break that because high risk HPV, the type that causes cancer, is an invisible infection and we want people to know about it and to talk about it. And that's why these events are so important. Today, we are going to focus on a very, 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 very important piece of legislation that aligns with our mission about increasing awareness and prevention of HPV. And as you know, like our government, is a mess and uh, we don't know if they're ever gonna do anything right again, but we have two amazing representatives, Kathy Castor, a uh, congressman from Florida, and we have Kim Schreier of Washington and they have sponsored a piece of legislation that can make an enormous difference 
on the lives of tens of thousands of Americas. <laughs> tens of thousands of Americas? No, Americans. Anyway, we um, we're so delighted to hear from them today. And after you hear about this bill, what we really would like for you to do is to write your legislators and support them. Um, and if you live in their districts, make sure you also support them and spread the word. And remember, it's we the people. So we the people support our legislators and then this bill can get passed and lives can get saved. So if you do one thing after the listening to this, write your legislators um, because you will be saving lives and we will be so grateful. Okay, and now let's turn it back to Lil and to our speakers. Thank you, Marsha. I love you, honey. I'm so honored to introduce our first speaker, Congresswoman Kathy Castor, who represents the Tampa Bay area of the beautiful state of Florida. You can only imagine how busy Kathy and her colleagues are currently giving everything that's going on in, D in Washington, DC. So we're incredibly grateful that she's able to spend time with us. Representative Castor has been elected to Congress in 2006 and represents Florida's 14th congressional district, which includes Tampa and parts of Hillsborough County. She's the first woman to represent Hillsborough and Pinellas counties in the US Congress. Representative Castor works on initiatives to create jobs, protect the environment and consumers, improve schools, ensure veteran, veterans receive the benefits and care they've earned, provide access to affordable health care, and defend protections for people with pre-existing health conditions. She has successfully fought to bring new, good-paying job opportunities to Tampa Bay's small businesses and large economic engines alike, including Port Tampa Bay, University of South Florida, Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute, and federally qualified community health centers, among others. In 2020 alone, her office worked to deliver nearly 1.6 million to veterans, seniors, small businesses, and families, almost 1.5 billion in federal grants to create jobs, invest in education and infrastructure, mitigate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and support the program work of local partners, and $2.7 billion in Paycheck Protection Program loans for Tampa businesses. Representative Pastor, thank you so much for joining us. Please make sure that your camera is on and you're off mute. Colin, please go ahead and bring Representative Pastor on. Let's give Colin a few seconds. Well, thanks Lillian and thank you to Marsha Cross and Dan Lifton and everyone with the HPV Alliance for hosting this event and asking me and my good friend, uh, Congresswoman Kim Schreier of Washington, Dr. Schreier, to discuss our bipartisan bill called the Promoting Resources to Expand Vaccination, Education, and New Treatments for Cancers Act, otherwise known as the Prevent HPV Cancers Act, or H.R. 1550. Uh, you'll be hearing from my good friend, Dr. Anna Giuliano from the Moffitt Cancer Center here in Tampa. But I want you all to know that she has been my partner for many years and has educated me on the importance of the HPV vaccine. So let's talk about that. Um, if leading scientists today announced at a press conference that we had found the cure for cancer, it would be cause for celebration. There would be parades, uh, the people would be celebrating in the streets. Well, the truth is since 2006, there has been a safe and effective vaccine that prevents cancer caused by the human papilloma virus. Uh, the HPV vaccine is one of only two cancer preventing vaccines that we have. And it's the only one that prevents six types of cancer, including cervical and oropharynx cancer. Of those, only cervical cancer has a recommended screening test to detect at an early stage. So vaccination is key to prevent the other HPV related cancers. And of course, contracting any of these cancers is devastating and costly to families across this country. Well, before the pandemic, the HPV vaccination rates uh, were lower than most childhood vaccinations, especially for adolescents in rural 
uh, areas and boys. But during the pandemic, we have seen a dramatic and troubling drop off in all childhood vaccinations, but particularly for HPV. Uh, according to data from the CDC, uh, HP, HPV vaccinations fell by 64% uh, for kids aged 9 to 12 71% for young people 13 to 17 compared to the previous two years. Last year alone, almost 1 million doses were missed. So we need to help get families back on track and do all we can to prevent cancer. And the HPV or the Prevent HPV Cancers Act will do just that uh, through a public awareness campaign run by the CDC. And this public awareness campaign needs to be culturally competent. Uh, that's vital, especially due to the drastic decrease in uh, childhood vaccinations. Uh, the rates, uh, we know that uh, we've got to target certain populations that already have low vaccination rates. For example, African-Americans, men, folks that live in rural areas. More than four out of 10 uh, of the cases of cancer caused by HPV uh, occur among men. And CDC reports that over 14,000 men in the United States are contracting HPV cancers annually. The rates of oral pharynx cancer in men has increased five-fold over the past 20 years. So we have special work to do to get boys vaccinated. And I'm, let me just say, I am so grateful for all the health experts who are going to uh, discuss uh, the, these issues here today. Uh, again, a shout out to Dr. Anna Giuliano. She came to the U.S. Capitol a few years ago and helped us organize a, a roundtable. That roundtable uh, turned into action because we heard from survivors about the physical and emotional toll uh, of HPV cancers. And that led us to craft this new Prevent HPV Cancers bill. And here's some good news for everyone. Um, Representative Schreier and I sit on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, last, or uh, just this summer, we, will, we were able to pass the bill out of committee. So it's waiting for floor action. And that's where you all come in. We need your help to encourage leaders to bring this to the floor. Help us get co-sponsors. Uh, help us spread the word. I know that this is such an important step uh, to helping get more people vaccinated for HPV so we can prevent uh, this insidious uh, cancer among so many of our neighbors. So thanks again for uh, inviting me here today. I look forward to working with all of you to eliminate HPV cancers and to save lives. So Lillian, thank you for all that you do, and I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you so much, Representative Castor. We really, really appreciate you being here um, and all the important work that you're doing. It's my honor to introduce Congresswoman and Dr. Kim Schreier, who represents Washington's 8th Congressional District. Prior to being elected to Congress on November 6, 2018, Kim spent her career as a pediatrician working with children and helping families navigate the healthcare system. In Congress, Kim uses this expertise to inform her work on issues that improve the lives, health, and well being of children. As the first pediatrician in Congress, Kim brings a critical voice to issues related to health care. Through her own experience as a patient living with type 1 diabetes, Kim understands the very real fear of health care costs and access for people living with pre existing conditions. And as a physician who has worked in a broken healthcare system, Kim understands what changes need to be made to make it work better for both patients and providers. After graduating from UC Berkeley Phi Beta Kappa, she attended, to, she attended the UC Davis School of Medicine and completed her residency at the Children's Hospital at Stanford University. In 2013, Kim was named Best Pediatrician in the Greater Seattle Area by Parents Map Magazine. And what does she do after reaching such a milestone? She decides to change careers and go into politics. And thank God she did, since she is doing amazing work in Congress, including supporting the Prevent HPV Cancers Act. 
I'm so grateful to her for giving her time today in spite of her incredibly busy schedule. Representative Schreier, if you could please ensure that your camera is on and that you're off mute. Colin, if you could please bring on Representative Schreier. Thank you. Let's give them a few seconds to get that set up. Well, thank you, Lillian, for that very warm introduction. And thank you, HPV Alliance. And of course, thank you to my friend and colleague, Representative Castor, for, um, for introducing this important bill and then bringing me on as an original co-sponsor. I'll tell you that it is always such a pleasure to work with you, whether that is on HPV prevention, climate policy, or women's softball. Um, you know, pediatricians and obstetrician gynecologists have been on the front lines of promoting the HPV vaccine. And gynecologists see cervical cancer, a preventative disease, a uh, preventable disease that kills over 4,000 women per year in this country. And that is despite a screening test for that disease. And so OBGYNs are singing from the rooftops about the benefits of the HPV vaccine. And after all, they should. I mean, this is a vaccine, as my colleague said, that prevents cancer. And we have theoretically said, wow, wouldn't it be a miracle if we had a vaccine that could prevent cancer, right? Just like my colleague, uh, Kathy Castor said, well, we have one. Just again, this vaccine prevents cancer. And one of the most important things we can do to help the healthcare system properly function and keep our patients healthy is to lean into preventative care in every way and moving care upstream, taking care of our patients early, getting them vaccinated is one of the best ways to keep our families and our communities healthy. And yet so many are reluctant to take this vaccine because of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, much like what we are seeing play out right now in the COVID vaccine rhetoric. And, and not just that, um, as already mentioned, the pandemic really caused many families to delay care and many teens missed this shot. In fact, we saw a more dramatic drop in childhood vaccines in the teenage, the tween and teenage group than in all other um, age groups of children. And so um, if, even, even before the pandemic though, uh, in 2019, only about 16% of U.S. adolescents had been fully vaccinated against HPV by their 13th birthday, despite national recommendations that this be given uh, first at 9 to 11 years old. So I can tell you as a pediatrician on the front lines of this that you would not believe uh, the worries that I heard from parents as a pediatrician. Um, it, you know, it was pretty easy to pick out the ones that were fabricated and thrown out on social media just to scare parents. Typically these were the rumors that this vaccine could have some effect on the reproductive system, like causing infertility. And of course there is no plausible scientific way that a vaccine against a virus would specifically target the reproductive system. And yet tying those together seemed to resonate uh, with parents. Um, and this kind of disinformation is so dangerous. You know, the, the other thing that I heard from parents was that they were worried um, that giving this vaccine could encourage their children to go out and have sex, which of course we know is not the case. And, you know, this is why conversations with the pediatrician are so important because we know that the number one most important factor in whether children get this immunization and immunizations in general is the recommendation from their physician. And that is why this bill is so important. Uh, we need to make sure people get trusted, good information, and this gets the reliable information out there. And it even gets information to doctors to help them communicate better about the vaccine. Um, so in my life, I'm also a mom. My son, who just turned that 13, has gotten his HPV vaccines, as have my patients, because I chose to make it a priority to talk about this. Now, I think there's another untapped resource out there, um, which is our ear, nose, throat doctors. And I can tell you that right at the beginning, in 2006, um, the children who I took care of who were sons and uh, sons specifically of ENT docs came in and said, uh, I want my sons to get this vaccine. Um, and, and because 
chewing tobacco and smoking used to be the most common cause of oral cancers. That's what we all learned way back in school, but that is no longer the case. It is now HPV. And so when parents of boys would ask, well, why should they bother giving their sons a vaccine meant to protect women? This is a really easy and compelling point to bring up that this affects men. Um, so I think that this is even part of a larger conversation about vaccines in general, that vaccines save lives. And there's so much mistrust out there and so much vaccine hesitancy out there. And um, while immunizations are one of the most important public health tools that we have, um, they work best when everybody gets them. And the last thing we need right now is an epidemic on top of a pandemic as we are navigating this COVID-19 emergency. And so it is more important than ever to get our children in for catch-up vaccines. So again, uh, the most important factor in whether a parent chooses to immunize their child is a conversation with their healthcare provider. And it is so important to have more public awareness about this specific vaccine. And that's why I'm so excited about this bill and partnering with my friend and colleague, uh, Kathy Castor. It is going to spread awareness so more people get vaccinated and lessen their chance of contracting HPV and the cancers that follow. So there is still more to do. Fund research, improve immunization information systems, set up systems for earlier detection of cervical cancer. But I am so proud to support my friend and colleague, Representative Castor, in this work and the greater work of ensuring our kids stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Schreier, for this highly informative talk and for spending your invaluable time with us today. We're very grateful. As we get into our panel discussion, I'm so happy to introduce our moderator, the one and only Anna Giuliano, who I'm sure many of you know, since she's been a thought leader and a preeminent researcher in the field of HPV associated cancer. Anna is the founding director of the Center for Immunization and Infection Research and Cancer at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. So she's located near Representative Castor and has worked closely with her. In fact, Anna and John DeMuro helped us connect with Kathy, so thank you to both of them. Her career had its inception in the relationship between human papilloma and human papillomavirus infections and cervical cancer in women and has evolved over the past 30 years to encompass HPV and penile, anal, and oral cancers in men, as well as other infectious diseases and their casual relationships with various cancers. Anna was recognized with the highly prestigious NIH National Cancer Institute Preventive Oncology Career Development Award. Oh, I have to take a break after that. And, Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Cancer Society. Dr. Giuliano has also authored over 400 peer-reviewed publications. We are delighted to have Dr. Giuliano today as our panel moderator. Let me now ask Anna and our three panelists to ensure that they are, their cameras are on and ask our video streaming guru, Colin, to bring up our panel on the video stream. Let's give them a few seconds. Absolutely, and thank you so much for that wonderful, warm introduction. And I just want to thank again our Congresswoman for um, bravely taking this on and shepherding this bill forward. Um, and we will do everything we can to make sure that this bill gets the support that it needs. Um, it's timely um, and it's it saves lives. And it's, all we need to think about is what can we do today to save thousands of lives here and be an example, a shining example for other countries around the world. Um, I happen to have three amazing panelists with me and I wanna quickly introduce everybody and then start a round robin of questions. So if, if you'll just bear with me for a little bit and let me introduce our three. I'm gonna start with Dr. Abraham Aragones, who is an internal medicine physician and public health researcher at Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center. His areas of expertise include working with primary care providers to assess barriers to cancer screening and prevention among minority and immigrant populations, specifically among Latino populations. 
He is currently working in the area of HPV vaccine practices among providers serving large minority populations. Um, now, what you're going to hear is including Abraham, others who are directly working in areas that are related to the issue and the various components of what it will take to actually eliminate these HPV-related cancers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Judith Smith, who is a professor in the Department of Obstructive Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Re Reproductive Sciences at UT Health McGovern Medical Center. And she's also the director of the Women's Health Integrative Medicine Research Program. One of her main research missions is to advance the progress of the safe and effective use of natural products with pharmacologic modalities as it relates to women's health and cancer. Judith's most recent research is supported by the NIH and is focused on patients with recurrent HPV. Um, so one of the themes you're gonna hear is also throughout this talk is the primary prevention with vaccine is essential to prevent that first infection, but also to prevent the recurrences that naturally occur both among men and among women. Now our third and not, least last uh, panelist is Dr. Marcelo Araujo, and you, you have to correct me, me if I pronounce that last name wrong. Um, he is the chief science officer of the American Dental Association and the CDC CEO of ADA's res research subsidiary, the ADA Science and Research Institute. He is an experienced researcher and practitioner has committed his career to improving oral health globally through research and public health policy. He's been an outspoken advocate for the prevention and early detection of HPV-associated oral cancers. And I just wanna put a little plug in, and most of us think about um, HPV and cervical cancer. And I'm not sure that everybody's aware that in the United States, the most commonly occurring cancer that is caused by HPV is actually the set of oral cancers that are primarily affecting men. Um, so as you can see, we actually have a group of panelists that represent each of the different areas that are so essential to accomplishing this mission of eliminating not just HPV, but all of the cancers, all six of the cancers that HPV causes. Um, so with that, let me kick off the first question. And Abraham, you're, you're the first on, on the list. Um, as a clinician and public health researcher, I know you spent a lot of time focusing on barriers to cancer prevention, that is both screening and behavioral interventions um, that help to promote um, a reduction in cancer, and especially among minority and immigrant populations. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us what you have observed in terms of what are some of the main barriers um, that special populations and underserved populations throughout this country are often facing that we need to overcome. Well, thank you so much, Anna, and thank you to, to, to the Alliance for the invitation to be part of this panel. I, I want to also thank the uh, representative. Uh, this act is perhaps one of the most consequential uh, steps that I have seen in my 14 years of working in the area of dissemination of the HPV vaccine um, that can truly make a difference. And uh, we've been waiting for a long time for something like this. So, so they have our full support and we'll be working together uh, to support this act as much as we can. Um, so in my 14 years of working disseminating this, this vaccine, I've seen many actual barriers and they have actually, um, uh, they have changed throughout the years. But what we see is what uh, Representative uh, Schroeder say, which is, um, uh, the, the lack of a provider recommendation is perhaps the most common barrier for all populations. So regardless of their ethnicity, their race, their gender, uh, we see that providers are not recommending the, the HPV vaccine as usual or as often as they recommend other vaccines. And there are multiple reasons for this. One of them is, for example, the fact that the HPV vaccine is not one that is mandatory to, uh, for school. Uh, in almost all states, just a few. Um, it, that actually triggers a longer discussion with patients, uh, time that actually providers don't have. The HPV is also associated and HPV is a sexually transmitted infection. So it might trigger actually a conversation about sex and sexually transmitted infections. 
that is also something that uh, that providers are actually trying to avoid when they only have five, 10, 15 minutes to actually recommend a series of uh, immunizations. Uh, but there's also this idea that that parents, providers have this idea that parents actually have many, many uh, uh, questions and misinformation about the vaccine. And it is true in part. Many of our um, uh, Latino populations in the United States have actually uh, a significant amount of uh, misinformation about HPV and misinformation about HPV from uh, the most common one being a, uh, an infection that only in, uh, affects women to the least common uh, but actually growing, which is a, a, an issue, an overall issue against all vaccines, so the anti-vaccine movement. Um, and sadly, uh, all those, despite the fact that we have 14 years now or 15 years now of the vaccine, all those barriers actually have been increasing in the Latino and African-American populations where we see the largest rates of, um, of um, cervical cancer and other types of HPV related cancer. So I would put uh, the first group of barriers, the, the big number of barriers within the, uh, within the provider and provider patient conversation, but we also have more structural barriers, more a, um, access in barriers. So uh, we, for example, know that parents and um, uh, adolescents that have insurance and have a primary source of care, a regular source of care, actually access the vaccine more often than those that don't. So it is important to continue to expand health insurance in this population. Um, we need to continue using a uh, immunization champions where the clinics uh, actually have someone that encourage every single patient to get the vaccine, every single eligible patient to get the vaccine, and in a manner that normalizes all those vaccines. And I think a lot of the, the aspects of this act actually touch on most of the things that I just discussed. Yeah, um, Ab Abraham, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, clearly access to healthcare is, is essential um, and predominantly essential when it comes to um, cervical cancer screening. Um, and, and just um, to get everybody on the same page, we're very fortunate in the United States that the HPV vaccine for um, children 18 and under is part of the entitlement program, um, which means that all populations, regardless of health insurance status, can actually access the vaccine. Um, so health insurance shouldn't be a barrier for receiving HPV vaccination. And I think we need to probably do a better job um, discussing that. But what has your experience been with, um, especially in, in um, minority populations, African-American and Hispanic population, in terms of barriers related to cervical cancer screening? So uh, a couple of things. One is that, um, to answer your question, one is uh, you're absolutely right about insurance. I wanna actually emphasize that the VFC or Vaccine for Children program covers all vaccines. The concern that we have and that we have seen often is the administrative fees. I mean, fees that actually parents have still have to pay despite the fact that they have a, a insurance to get a vaccine, to get an appointment with a physician. And we still see that as a barrier uh, for vaccines in general and more specifically for HPV. In, ter in terms of accessing a, um, a cervical cancer screening, uh, early detection, or in general cancer screening, we know that access to care as a whole is a, is a major issue for uh, Latinos. And we see actually one of the lowest rates of uh, cervical cancer screening in the Latino population. Same thing for other types of cancer, colorectal cancer and, and others. Um, the, one of the main reasons is, again, we can go back to insurance, and although that actually has changed, but that, that uh, continues to be an issue. But uh, we have to go through the entire um, uh, list of barriers that we see in the population, and, and that includes language and accessing information in the uh, primary language of the participants, the patients, so Spanish and other languages as well, too. Um, we have a large, for example, a sample um, population of Afro-Caribbeans in our area, and uh, we tend to believe that they actually either speak English or Spanish, and we're missing the Creole and they don't have actually the opportunity to access uh, uh, some of the um, uh, cervical cancer screening uh, information that otherwise they, they would. So that's another aspect, that's another um, barrier, but also, and the, the more difficult one is sort of like a cultural aspect of cancer screening, cancer prevention, the fatalism that we see in our populations and all of that, although difficult, and, and I don't mean to minimize that, all that actually can be changed 
with good information, with time, with a good, good conversation between providers and patients. And we have uh, an exhaustive amount of data showing that. Um, so I would group them into uh, uh, access to care. Those are the typical barriers, uh, but they can be split into language. They can be split into uh, insurance and cost issues that still remain an issue. And then uh, um, more of the cultural aspects of accessing care. And again, it's not just in cervical cancer. It's very important in this case, but it's also for other types of um, uh, uh, cancer prevention services. Yeah, thank, thank you, Abraham. And it's a, it's a wonderful segue to Judith, who is actually, you know, in addition to all the research that she does as a professor in obstetrics and gynecology, she's in the front line. Um, so Judith, you're seeing a lot of female patients as a provider at the Health Sciences Center in Houston. So I kind of think of Texas and Houston as, as being sort of an epicenter, little microcosm of the United States in terms of all of these issues with um, probably every population that we see here in the United States. Um, a lot don't have access to healthcare for a variety of reasons. Um, and so wondering um, what are some of the barriers that you've seen now, you know, here you are in, in the practice of screening um, so what are some of the issues that have come up in your practice that you've observed? So um, I think screening has really taken the hardest hit in the past two years with COVID um, and patients just not wanting to come to healthcare facilities or just the barriers to get in the door in the first place and get appointments. Um, Education, I mean, it all comes back to that. It's been a common theme through our discussion today of educating the public better, educating providers better, but definitely um, trying to eliminate that stigma associated with HPV um, and cancer screening, understanding that a lot of patients just don't even grasp the concept that a virus can cause cancer. So really getting back to the basics for um, patients and starting young. Um, we have started a lot of educational programs at the high school level and colleges. Um, Houston's also uh, an epicenter of education. So we have a number of universities and smaller community colleges. So outreach through that. Um, and our the University of Texas um, and multiple sites have gone to the community outreach programs and going to underserved communities and providing cancer screening, not only for cervical cancer, but um, colon cancer screening as well as breast cancer screening. So going to them rather than waiting for them to come to us has helped um, minimize some of those barriers. But I think education, um, like Abraham said, in primary language, is helpful. We have a lot of undocumented citizens that are coming over um, and or in through the airports too is not necessarily just across the border. Um, so language barriers um, and then so you know understanding the different cultural um, ways to communicate um, so that we're respectful is really important. So Judith when you um, are with a, a patient and you recommend that they, they're screened, that it's time they're due for their screening. Um, do you get resistance? Is there, are, are patients saying no? Or do you typically find that once you make that recommendation um, that the patient is, is, is okay with proceeding? Yeah, I think once they're, if we get them into the office and we're recommending screening, that, that half the battle has been won there. Um, it's, you know, making sure um, patients even know what like some of those early signs and symptoms of uh, maybe not necessarily full-blown cancer, but understanding how important early detection can change the course of treatment, not to use scare tactics on the public, but to make sure they understand like early detection, we can cure you. If you put off and ignore those symptoms, then, you know, it's a lot harder to beat the cancer. And so um, even kind of educating on the spectrum of HPV cancers and not necessarily, it's not always mortality, but it may be morbidity associated with it too. And just understanding the bad outcomes um, and limited quality of life after cancer. Um, Judith, do you see, um, I, there, I guess I have two questions for you. Um, one is, um, when you have treated a woman for cervical dysplasia, um, do you see that this dysplasia occurs again? So is it recurring? Um, unfortunately, unless you eradicate the 
HPV infection, which removing dysplasia, which is an often misconception like, oh, I've got the colon, um, you know, gotten the cone done and the dysplasia has been cured. And a lot of patients walk away thinking they're quote cured. Um, but the HPV infection can be recurrent um, and they still need, and if not more so, vigilant screening once they've had um, dysplasia or any kind of early signs of cancer. So the, the surgical removal or um, offer office procedures like a leap that may remove dysplasia does not curative. And that's kind of a misconception out there. Yeah, and in, in fact, it's why, you know, there's some, in some settings in Spain, um, based on the data that they have, and have actually developed a policy to vaccinate with the HPV vaccine at the time of treating women for dysplasia to help prevent those recurrences. And this is a whole other topic. We've been talking about adolescent vaccination, but we do have licensure for vaccine up to age 45. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just, Judith, one more question about barriers. Um, so, you know, it, and we hear a lot about um, misconceptions when a woman hears that she has cervical dysplasia, that often she, she jumps to the word cancer. And I'm just wondering how much do you see that happening? And do you think, is that influencing whether women then um, decide to continue with the treatment that they need for that dysplasia? Are you seeing people, women drop from the system who should be receiving treatment, but just assume it's, you know, as, as Abraham said, there's this fatalism of, oh, it must be cancer and I don't need to do anything. Um, fortunately, we're really um, thorough about making sure we educate the difference. Um, so where we see a lot of patients fall off is um, when they actually do have that early stage diagnosis and they have to get a hysterectomy and they're like, oh, I don't want I want to have children and they don't understand um, and grasp the concept um, that this is, you know, going to get worse uh, before it gets better. So um, I think it, it all goes back to educating and just really that first visit can take a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, in the, in the current state of healthcare, um, unfortunately, our providers don't have the time that they need. Um, so we're going to have to get really creative. And I, I want to hold on to that because um, I really want to hear what everybody thinks about creative ways of overcoming some of these barriers. Um, but, you know, I, I brought up this issue of mid-adult vaccination, um, which, if anything, it's probably most important for um, men um, and the prevention of oropharyngeal cancer. And, um, and since this is so clearly in the oral health area, Marcelo, I was hoping um, you could give us some um, insights in what the dental community is thinking about and, and some of the barriers maybe the dentists are, are seeing in terms of even talking about HPV, let alone HPV vaccination. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Lillian, Marsha, Dan, and the HPV Alliance for allowing me to be part of this panel. Um, I will start saying that on behalf of the ADA, 162,000 members, we fully support this legislation. We have been uh, working very hard to make sure that we talk to our constituents and our members to make sure that they get support uh, through our advocacy programs. Um, the ADA has policy on prevention of HPV since 2018, and Anna, you and I were lucky to work together on the paper, the systematic review, that looking to many ways that we can do prevention and also bring this uh, to the dentist in form. Uh, the House of Delegates of the ADA brought this policy in because we saw the increased number, the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer, as many of you said before, you and others have said the numbers have increased, and past cervical cancer. Uh, with that, we saw the need to re-educate our members, re-educate the dentists. They take the ability of giving them uh, tools to speak to their patients. If you think about this, uh, people go to the dentist at least twice a year, especially when you are in, an, in the age of 11 to 21 years of age. Uh, you're going to the dentist not just to get your regular cleaning, but also a lot of the times for ortho to do braces and other things. So there are a lot of times that we can have that touch point information. Yeah, there is a one barrier. The dentists are not used to talk about HPV. 
right? So we have to give them tools so they are able to then feel comfortable to talk about this because a lot of the times the parents will come back to our members and say, wait a minute, why are you talking about a sexually transmitted disease when I'm here for a dental cleaning? Because it's a, sex, it's a virus that can cause a oropharyngeal cancer, head neck cancer, or throat cancer. There are different ways that we call to help our patients understand the physical. The problem is the only good way to identify is by visual uh, uh, examination. We still don't have a lot of tools that can allow us to then. So a lot of the times when we see the lesion is already in some of the stage that could not prevent, could not do. So the person will have to go through surgery. And a lot of the times the surgery it's not, the outcome of the surgery may be not very pleasant to the looks of the people, right? So it's very important that we start early and we start with this policy and educate. We change completely the type of conversations that we have with our members. We created brochures, we created webinars, we publish papers, and we're bringing constant reminders to our members. Every April, we were talking only about oral cancer. We start talking about also oral pharyngeal cancer and HPV uh, vaccination. With that, we saw a lot of increase on the communication. You know. Our tools, our C courses have been very popular with our members. People are starting to call us and understand how they can help and prevent. And we see a lot of actions. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, during the year, a lot of type of mission of mercy where we bring uh, dental uh, professionals to the communities. And we are now not just talking about carries periodontal disease, but we're also talking about prevention or pharyngeal cancer through vaccines. So with that, we are helping our members to be more comfortable, you know, and help them not just to talk by themselves, but also connect with the pediatrician, connect with the uh, OB, the, the gynecologist, connect with their physicians, the primary care, because unfortunately in this country, there's only one state where uh, a dentist is allowed to vaccinate for HPV, which is Oregon, right? So with that, we have to then work with referral. So that's another barrier and, and that we have, that we have to work with our prof uh, healthcare professional partners to help them take the patients that come to see us and then help them, especially through the parents. And the one number one point where we lose that opportunity is the moment that the the parents, specifically the mother, leaves the office with the child. And we want to make sure that, that when she leaves or when they leave, they make that call to the pediatrician, they make that call to the primary care, or they make the call to the pharmacist. In that moment, they schedule the appointment for the, for the vaccination. Because six months later, they're going to come back. And guess what? Six months later, they have to take the second dose. So we're working very close. And uh, I'm glad that we are able to support this bill uh, moving forward. Oh, Marcelo, I had not realized, I was wondering where it stood with um, dentists being able to vaccinate, and I didn't know that it was only allowed in one state. Um, I, I can see a policy, um, a, a need for a new policy here, and I'm, I'm wondering, is the ADA working on that um, to help um, expand the practice of vaccination in dental offices? Yes, we are. So we are trying to make sure that our dentists, our members understand the need uh, for the vaccine, but also to bring into there. So it's a state by state kind of policy and legislation. The main barrier, as uh, we know, I'm not going to get into the technical piece of here, is the storage of this vaccine. So I'm very pleased to see that the bill that is we are here to support also has a major investment in research. And I'm hoping that major investment in research can also bring some new technology, some new ways where we can bring to not just through the dental office, but uh, to the communities out, out there, right? So there are people in the middle of the country that don't see a, um, a physician all the time and they need to have that vaccine sent to them. So we need to find other ways, you know, like they did with the COVID vaccines with new innovation that we can bring also this type of innovation to HPV vaccine and help to get them to storage in a good way and to give them to uh, all the people that need. No, uh, absolutely. Um, and so, I mean, this really kicks off the, the second part, which is um, what can we do to overcome some of these barriers? And, and you're absolutely right, Marcelo, the bill includes a component for expanding research to solve more, solve some of these problems. And a lot of it is in the realm of what we call implementation science. 
Um, I, I just want to say the ADA has always been a leader in prevention, and um, and it's it's also very clear that what happens in terms of the oral health influences cancer, like oropharyngeal cancer and oral cancer, but um, also heart disease. And so I, I really appreciate the the movement of ADA to take this on and and lead the way because I think it can have a huge impact um, in what we're doing. Um, but with that, I kind of want to open it up and, and ask um, you and Judith and Abraham to um, maybe um, provide some input on some thoughts you've had of um, what we can do to overcome some of the barriers that you have identified so far. And um, anybody ready to jump in? Uh, I'll give it a try. If, uh, so uh, there are multiple areas and we can discuss this for hours. I think some of them Judy and Marcella would be more than happy to have a conversation for hours about this, and, and we can truly have it. But I would just mention a few. I think we need to normalize the HPV vaccine. I mean, this idea that this is a separate vaccine, that some may or may not get it, uh, maybe between 9 and 11, maybe later, um, it is just too difficult at this point. I mean, some actually have to get it for, for school, some don't. Um, we need to normalize the vaccine. We need to uh, make sure that providers actually give a strong recommendation for the vaccine, not one that is just weak or opens the opportunity to uh, for you know discussions of, of things like anti-vaccine or things like that, but strong recommendation. I think those two from the provider side are key. The other side is basically uh, having a good good enough instruments to or, or good instruments to prime parents to go and ask for the vaccine. And Lillian mentioned this at the beginning, we have to make this a sexy topic. Uh, we here have a vaccine to prevent cancer. I mean, what better than that? And we have to make parents aware of that. And I think by making them aware of that with good information, we will prime them to actually uh, be very open and adhere to the, the provider recommendation next time that they go to see their child pediatrician. And for themselves as well too, Anna, I, I'm 100% I'm with you that we need to actually continue to discuss this, this vaccine for adults as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, to, I, to yes. Definitely. Um, I think uh, we can all learn a lot from the success of um, learning about H HIV awareness and how, um, you know, for a while there, it was just really thrown in the face. I don't think the general public really appreciates what HPV cancer outcomes are and what, you know, even, you know, they know what cancer is bad, but no one really appreciates it. Um, what could be the impact of having an HPV cancer on their ability to have children or their ability to speak even or eat or swallow and I really think we need to do better in educating people like why we want to prevent these cancers because until they have them or know someone with that HPV cancer then they're coming to you oh I need to be vaccinated because my husband has this mm -hmm. or my wife just got cervical cancer or whatever and it's like but you know what, you probably already have HPV at this point, you know, so it's a little late. Um, and understanding like the bad outcomes might make people more motivated in preventing it. And so I think we just assume everyone knows what cancer is and cancer is so different depending on the spectrum mm -hmm. of what type of cancer you have. So like really giving them some visualization um, on the media, like or showing them what are some outcomes, even if it's I don't, the various media outlets of social media, uh, short videos, short education of like, this is why we want to prevent HPV. Like why, focusing on the why, I think we might get more bit buy-in than just you know, trust I, us as healthcare providers, you should yeah. do this because you don't want to. Um, what I love you, you just said something that I really love, which is um, why don't we do what the HIV Get to Zero campaign has done? Um, and I don't know how many are familiar with it. Um, Judith, you just hinted at it. Um, what it and, and I think one of the themes we've been hearing here is communication, right? And one of the brilliant things that the HIV Getting to Zero campaign did was it that one slogan, really, really simple with really simple action items and simple strategic goals. 
And every single community, what's really wonderful, I've seen the um, work from Miami-Dade County, they use those exact same words, but they have translated into Spanish, into Creole, into all these different languages. And those exact words are used in San Francisco, are used in Boston, are used in Thailand, are used in China, all over the world. Everyone is singing the same tune with the same strategic plan. And I think if we can get to that point, and maybe you just starting here in the United States and then share that globally, we we, we would start making headway in, in solving some of these problems. Um, so Judith, thank you for bringing up that, that issue of HIV because we have the tools. I, I didn't mention, we do have the tools. In fact, I don't know of any other elimination campaign that the world is on that has the tools that we have. We have screening for cervical cancer, treatment for, for um, cervical dysplasia to prevent the cancer, and we have vaccination to prevent all those cancers. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's something we should consider, and we need to mm -hmm. bring in our dental friends, not just our yeah. physician friends. So Where's Anna, I think you, you summarized really well in thinking about this view again, right? So the, the way uh, the Congresswomen wrote this is so important because there is a component for the dissemination that will allow all type of healthcare uh, professionals to bring this communication, to break the barrier of, I don't want to talk to my patients about HPV because of the stigma that may be behind it. We have to put this down. So the dissemination and putting all the appropriation for like several years will help us to get there. But also, as I said before, the research. Without this, we're not going to be able to do translational research, which is, right. can we look to see if what we're doing is really working? It's not just to develop new uh, medications, but also what are we doing? Is it working? Dissemination is so important, right? And uh, I think when we see all this together, and if we can bring through HPV Alliance or through other groups, uh, more campaigns to our members that you are uh, our profession. I think that's what we see the impact. So I'm glad this is happening. Wonderful. And thank you, um, panelists. Um, we, we're at that hour. I'm sorry, we could talk for hours about <laughs> this. Um, so let me turn it back over to Lillian and Dan from the HPV Cancers Alliance um, for some closing comments. And, and hopefully we can do this again. Thank you so much, Anna, Judith, Abraham, and Marcelo for this incredibly thoughtful and information panel. We hope that our audience has learned a lot and that, it's, and that it has helped all of us appreciate the serious problems that face us, the available solutions, and how the Prevent HPV Cancers Act can help us bring about those solutions. Let me now introduce the third co-founder, of the HPV Cancers Alliance, who will share with us what we can all do to help get this important act passed. And I'm going to tell you that this third co-founder is the wind beneath all of us. And we would not be here today if it weren't for him. He's very humble, but I'm gonna brag about him because he is Dan the man at all times. So Dan, take it away. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, you certainly know how to make a man blush, so I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a great honor for me to work with you, Lillian, and with Marsha and our board and our incredible medical advisory board who generously donate their time to helping us day in, day out. Um, I think it's important uh, for us to recap why we at the HPV Cancers Alliance have endorsed this act so strongly. And I think Dr. Argonne has put his finger on it, which is that this is truly a game changer. We have a lot of very passionate people who want to drive change. But as you know, in this world, you need resources. You need financial resources. And the resources currently being dedicated to this cause by our government is really paltry. So uh, the first important impact of this act is that by getting $50 million a year appropriated um, toward a messaging and information campaign to be guided by the Centers for Disease Control, to explain the importance of the vaccination through a national awareness campaign, through combating misinformation, which we know how harmful can be when it comes to vaccines of all kinds, and ultimately to increasing HP vaccination rates uh, can make a tremendous difference. 
Likewise, there will be grants and cooperative agreements that will be provided to local and state governments. And we know that working at a local level is tremendously important, which is why the work that Representative Kester and Schreier have been doing not only federally, but also on a local level. You heard about the collaboration with, with Anna and the Moffitt Cancer Center. That's why it's so incredibly important. In addition, at, this act also provides $10 million a year for five years toward research in HPV associated cancers. Uh, again, this is a very rare set of cancers that are uh, often preventable uh, and that we actually have a cancer vaccine for, but more work can always be done. Um, and there will be funding directed through the NCI, National Cancer Institute, and the NIH to further improve outcomes. So we believe that's tremendously important and we hope that you share our view. Um, we want to conclude our town hall today with a call to action. It's important to learn and to understand, uh, but ultimately it's that grassroots action that we all take that can make an impact. As rep both representative told us, getting your local legislators support this act is going to make a tremendous amount of difference. They get a lot of mail and they may not read your exact letter, but if they're hearing from their congressional aide that there are a lot of people that have written in support of a certain act, they start paying attention. Uh, representatives care about their voters, so you can all make an impact. And we try to make it very easy for you. If you go on our website, hpvalliance.org slash act, um, you will be able to link through to our partner, Phone to Action, and you fill out your name and your zip code, and it automatically sends the letter to your legislators, your congressmen or women, your senators, as well as even your local representatives. And we've also included a form letter on our website, again, hpvalliance.org slash act, where you can copy and paste that letter if you'd like to revise, but make sure you submit it. So that's very, very important. We urge you all to do that. Secondly, please spread the word. Let other people know that it's an important act. Forward them the link, get them to do the same. Uh, as you can imagine, the power of numbers works. If you send it to 10 people and those 10 people send it to another 10 people, they can make an impact. And thirdly, is that we encourage you to support the two representatives uh, who join us today. You can imagine how busy things are in DC and yet they invested their time. This is not a political event, it's purely an information event. So they're amazing and we want more politicians like that serving for our government in their current positions and even in better places, hopefully. So we hope that you do support them. Um, finally, just before turning over to Lillian, again, I wanna thank all of our partners and people who made it possible. Colin, who's been amazing. If you ever need a videographer and a person to do this for us, uh, ask us so we can refer him. Uh, also, Danielle Riley-Weed, who runs all of our PR. Her agency is Mediatonic. She's incredible. Andrea Miller at Your Tango um, and her team, who's been spreading the word and publishing articles. And uh, Andrea is also a published author of a book called Radical Acceptance that I always plug whenever I get a chance, so please pick it up. And um, to all of you for dialing in. So um, on that note, let me turn it over to Lillian to help wrap us up today. Go ahead, Lillian. Thank you so much, Dan. You are awesome. Um, thank you again to our two representatives, our panelists, our mission partners, our sponsors, and also the members of the HPV Cancers Alliance Board and Medical Advisory Board. You're all amazing, and I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful to all of you for everything you do. We definitely could not be here if it weren't for all of you. And on that note, let me say goodbye. Actually, maybe so long, because you're going to see us soon, I think, you know, sooner than later. And um, thank you for attending, and please stay tuned for our next event.